Um, we have no idea when or how this pandemic is going to end. How is it even possible to formulate a recovery plan in the budget or discuss a possible way out of this recession? Well, Lee, you're absolutely right. It's very difficult in this environment to act with any certainty about um, some of the, the economic numbers. I mean, if you go back to uh, March, the Federal Treasury was expecting the June quarter to fall by around 20%. Uh, back in May, they said it would fall by around 10%. Today, we saw the June quarter GDP numbers fall by their largest amount on record, namely 7%. So how do you uh, so frame forecasting the budget then? It's a very difficult environment and no less an authority than the Governor of the Reserve Bank has said uh, how difficult it is to, to forecast in this period. But the key part of our policies have been to ensure that they're demand driven and that they can respond to needs. So take the JobKeeper program at $101 billion it can respond and it can flex where there is greatest need. So in the case of Victoria, we're going to see more people on JobKeeper in, this, in the subsequent months than from all the other states and territories combined. And that's a reflection of the economic hardship being experienced by Victorians right now. Are you going to go ahead with the planned tapering to income support from this month? Well, the program was always meant to be transitioning over time. Initially, JobKeeper was legislated for six months. But circumstances have, done... have changed quite a bit since then. And that's why we responded by expanding and extending that scheme for another six months. And at $101 billion, it's the biggest economic support program um, that has ever been undertaken. But is I it see the time the... to start tapering? Well, it, it, I think it is important to transition because outside of Victoria, the jobs are coming back. Seven out of our eight jurisdictions are actually opening up and easing restrictions. Of the 1.3 million Australians who lost their job or saw their hours reduced to zero since the start of this crisis, we've now seen 700,000 or more than half come back. And of the 340,000 jobs that were created in the last two months, importantly, 58% of those have gone to women and 44% have gone to young people. So there is some hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We just need to get the virus under control. Of the 657 COVID deaths in Australia, four have been under the age of 50. Mm. That means that the majority of the working population is being asked to take a huge and indefinite hit to their mm. economic wellbeing, their social wellbeing, their mental health, when their own personal risk is very low. So far, Australians are by and large on board with that policy approach. But has the government done any more as to how long that compliance will last, particularly once you start to remove income support? Well, our belief is that Australians will follow the medical advice and that has been our experience to date. But every life is important. I don't think you should be comparing um, the life of an elder Australian uh, to, to, to a younger one. We need to do everything we can to save both cohorts of our population. That's why we've invested record amounts in the health response. That's why we've deployed 1,700 plus personnel from the Australian Defence Force to Victoria. We've set up OSMAT teams and other, um, and other medical professionals because everything we are doing is designed to get this health crisis under control because only when you get the virus under control can you get the economic recovery. Some states with negligible coronavirus cases are, as we heard in Laura Tingle's piece, keeping their mm. borders shut and they can do that partly because their populations aren't feeling the full economic pain of the pandemic mm. because of the income support payments. Should states keeping their borders closed now stump up for those payments themselves? Well, states need to spend more, and they're not my words, they're the words of the Governor of the Reserve Bank. He told National Cabinet, he told the state and territory treasurers that they could contribute an extra $40 billion or 2% of GDP over the next two years, because so far our response has totaled $314 billion, or equivalent to 15.8% of GDP, whereas the state's response has been $48 billion, or around 2.4% of their gross state product. So there's been a big difference between what we've invested in and what they've invested in. So I think all states, regardless of whether their borders are open or shut, should be doing more, investing in infrastructure, investing in social housing, providing payroll tax and land tax relief. Since there is no vaccine or cure yet for, for coronavirus, doesn't the former Prime Minister Tony Abbott have a point that there are difficult conversations that need to be had about what is a manageable number of cases and by inference deaths in the community at any one time? 
I look forward to you getting all the hate mail for, <laughs> for making that comment about Tony Abbott. I mean, the reality is, um, you know, Tony Abbott's entitled to his own views and we heard from two other treasurer, uh, two other former Prime Ministers this week from the other side of politics. I mean, we need to just manage the, their health response as but, best as we can and that's what we're doing. But with Tony Abbott's remarks, regardless of how he framed them, at the core of it is the point that if we wanted zero deaths from coronavirus, we could lock everyone up indefinitely. Mm. If we didn't care, you'd let everybody out and they could do whatever and you go for herd immunity. Presumably we have to land somewhere in the middle of that. Isn't that a conversation that needs to be had about what that looks like? Well, we've never been seeking to eliminate the virus. I think that's an important point to make. Our strategy is all about suppression and that's why the contact tracing and testing is so critical. You see, in the last 24 hours, you've seen 17 cases in New South Wales, but you haven't seen their border closed like you've seen in Queensland or Western Australia. They've managed um, to deal with the virus much better than I think other jurisdictions have. So you need to take into account the economic impacts of your policies, and that's why I've been so vocal, as well as the business community, in calling for Victoria to provide a roadmap out of Stage 4. The public's constantly told we're all in this together but the burden is unequal particularly when you look at the evidence of the death toll in aged care hundreds of people mm. those Australians in care are paying a higher price than any other group in society because they're weak they don't have a voice they're out of sight since 2017 alone there have been 12 reviews into the quality of aged care in Australia and few of the recommendations have been implemented how can anybody in government live with that well, as you know, there's a Royal Commission underway. We've already announced an investment of more than $1.5 billion in aged care in response to this pandemic. But, we'll Treasury, taking... this is, this, uh, what I'm pointing to is the mm. problems in aged care have been highlighted for a really long time and politicians on both sides seem to have sat back and not done that much about it and we're paying the price now. Well, I would accept there's some real challenges in that sector and that is why the Royal Commission is underway and we await its findings early next year. But, but why has it taken budget... that for something to happen? As I said, 12 reviews since 2017. And there have been a number of changes that have been introduced over that time. But when, it, when you look at the aged care sector, um, we have been increasing our funding. We will be spending more within this year's budget. Just this week alone, Lee, we announced $560 million of additional funding for aged care with support to those providers as well as directly to the workforce to provide greater, um, greater support to them because they're so critical in this pandemic. And of course, after we receive the Royal Commission report, I think there will be a very substantial response from the government which will be contained in the budgets thereafter. Treasurer, thank you. Good to be with you.